This week we're going to be talking about the reconstruction period in U.S. history. Uh, we won't be going too deep into it. Um, Dad, you want to just give a, a little overview of what we'll be covering? Sure. Um, there are all kinds of uh, theories, all kinds of explanations uh, for reconstruction, all sides of the issues. Debbie uh, Du Bois uh, wrote a huge uh, a piece about reconstruction, for example. But what I'm going to do is, I'm not going to get into any of that, but what I will do is just look at some very basic things that took place during this period of time. And, um, and so sort of uh, build up to a sort of post-reconstruction world uh, for next time, next time we do this. The, um, the reconstruction really sort of began the latter stages of the Civil War in many regards. The uh, Union Army had was pretty much dominating everything. Uh, through 18, uh, 1865, the Confederacy was really falling apart. Of course, the war ended in April 1865, uh, almost exactly four years after it began. Lincoln was assassinated shortly thereafter. Uh, the Confederate President Jefferson Davis went on the run, and was finally captured in May 1865, as he was trying to rebuild a new Confederate government, the Confederate Army, which uh, frankly had no, no chance to uh, 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 revive itself by themselves. So the uh, Republican Party was already dominant in American politics in the North. And since the South had not yet come back into the Union, and when it really did, at least initially, many of the individuals who represented the South in the Congress were former slaves, um, uh, maybe Northerners who represented Southern states. Uh, and so, uh, but the South did not have full representation of its own of, of its own members or own citizens, or for that matter, white replacing the blacks until uh, some, a little bit later on. But in 1865, though, um, in December 1865, the 13th Amendment was passed outlawing slavery. So, with slavery now banned uh, from the Union, you know, again, remember it was uh, constitutionally. Uh, allowed, uh, dating back when the convention took place in 1787, the um, uh, slavery is now over, and you know, with the new president and uh, with new president uh, Andrew uh, Johnson, who is again uh, regarded as one of the worst presidents in American history, uh, begins a period of contentiousness uh, between the president and the Congress. Uh, that lasted through you know the end of uh, Johnson's uh, time as the president. The um, Johnson was from Tennessee, and but he remained loyal to the Union. Uh, he uh, was was one of those individuals who theoretically disliked slave owners, but he bowed down to them once he became president. He was a person who opposed slavery, not because of what did the black people, but what it did to white people. Uh, he felt it made white people lazy. He felt that it hurt initiative of whites. And so, uh, but again, when he became president, then he pretty much gave whatever they wanted, actually. So in 1866, the Congress, seeing that the country still, you know, trying to recover from a war, uh, went ahead and introduced something, a bureaucracy, if you will, became known as the Freedmen's Bureau. And the Freedmen's Bureau was only last for a year. They provided funding for housing, uh, to find, for jobs, to rebuild parts of the South. And all this is for whites and blacks. Um, but in 1867, Johnson then declared that, well, Reconstruction is successful, it's over with, and now we can move on. Congress saw that things in the South had a long way to go. So it extended the Freedmen Bureau for another five years. So basically it lasts from 1866 to 1872. And during this period of time, you have some black colleges in this period of time and later, black colleges got started uh, among other things. But people again, you know, were able to uh, rebuild, they were able to uh, uh, get jobs, they were able to uh, feed their families. And that really was the important aspect of this whole thing here. In 1868, the 14th Amendment was passed, giving uh, a Blacks and European immigrants uh, citizenship. Now, the 14th Amendment, there's more to it than just citizenship. 
but I'll just leave it at that for the moment. And then maybe in the future, I'll get into uh, some Supreme Court decisions that dealt with the 14th Amendment. And then in 1870, the 15th Amendment was passed, uh, which gave black men the right to vote. One of the great ironies in all this is that black men got the right to vote uh, on a national basis 50 years before white women, or for that matter, black women, uh, were given the right to vote. But the reason why this happened, the reason why black men got the right to vote and not white women, uh, besides the obvious sexism here, uh, but there's something that's also quite political. The, um, the Republican Party was now in power. Uh, they had the presidency, they controlled the Congress, and so the feeling, and it was being taken over really by big business interests along the eastern seaboard out of New York, Boston, Philadelphia. And in order to maintain uh, control of the government, uh, and understanding that the heavily Democratic South was coming back into the Union, uh, slowly but surely, uh, if you're going to maintain dominance, then you need more votes. And what better place to go than to black men? Because the fact that they would remember, they would remember that it was the Republican Party that went to war to end slavery. It was the Republican Party that, that ended slavery. It was the Republican Party that gave them citizenship and the Republican Party that gave them the right to vote. So they figured that blacks would vote Republican for decades, which actually was what, to, what happened. Well, all right, so why black men and not white women? And for that matter, black women. Well, first of all, black women are female, so that's part of it, but let's just talk about white women here. The South is a place, particularly at that time, where women did what the husband told them to do. And, and really, it was, it was really as simple as that. There were no secret ballots. If you worked for someone and, that, and, and, the first, and your boss wanted you to vote for candidate X, he could literally look over your shoulder to see who you're voting for. And if you vote for candidate Y, you could be fired. Well, the same thing happened really, the same situation really with, with spouses. In those days, it was not frowned upon to beat your wife. You know, today you just don't do that. You don't hit a woman. But in those days, you know, the husbands didn't hit their wives. And so she had better do what he told her to do. So the Republicans in charge of all this decided that we'll give black men the right to vote because if you give white women the right to vote, it could, it could neutralize the black vote. Therefore, to maintain uh, dominance, will give black men the right to vote. That's really, that really was the big thing at that time. <coughs> so the, the women not getting the right to vote is couched in a variety of ways. Well, you're the purity of the nation. Politics is dirty and nasty business, and you're too pure and clean to do, get involved in all this. But again, it just still came down to votes and sexism. Now, the uh, uh, Freedmen's Bureau certainly uh, you know, did what it could as a bureaucracy to help out. But, you, but Reconstruction, though, uh, was more than just all these, uh, these laws and these various amendments here. And so the, one of the problems, though, was the fact that the Ku Klux Klan got started in the late 1860s, and it became a, quite a violent group here. And indeed, Congress actually passed a law uh, around 1870 banning the Ku Klux Klan. Well, you can certainly ban the Klan, but there are other organizations that can pop up. And at the same time, you still have people's attitudes uh, that are not, have not changed. From the Southern perspective, you know, they've, been, they, they've grown up being told that black people were inferior. And this war comes along, the union wins the war, and all of a sudden they're equals. A lot of people had a hard time dealing with that. And so, and, and so therefore, things became really violent in the South. When um, uh, Johnson, President Johnson and the Congress disagreed on Reconstruction and the Congress added you know, time to the Freedmen's Bureau, they also did other things as well. So that when Grant became president, one of the things that took place was that with rising violence in the South, you now send the military in the South to try to keep the peace and protect black people. 
So by the time, so between the time Grant became president and until the 1870s elections, violence continued to rise to the point where it looked like there's going to be a second civil war. Um, the Northerners who went to the South were constantly being attacked regardless of their uh, intentions, whether they intended to hurt or to harm. And so uh, it, it really became a, a quite a contentious period of time. Support for keeping the troops in the South uh, began to diminish. So that by the time the election took place, Grant was one of the very few people who supported having the troops down there. So it was quite a uh, bad situation um, that, that was going along here. And so, uh, so various uh, instances were taking place left and right with people being attacked, killed, what have you. You have black people running for office and winning. You have black people um, you know, in, in government. But having said all that though, uh, their support began to whittle away as violence increased as their supporters were really killed off or threatened. So that by the time it got to the mid to late 1870s, and certainly to the 1880s, there are very few black politicians in the South who were able to go ahead and run for office to win. Uh, and that is if they were brave enough to run in the first place, because again, there are always death threats. So the backdrop of all this, we had the 1876 uh, election. And one of the things I should point out was that the Grant administration was quite corrupt. Grant himself was most likely very honest, uh, but he was surrounded by very corrupt people in his administration. So that became a big campaign issue in 1876, as well as military occupation of the South. So when the campaign, so, and so in the election, you have the last two individuals, Rutherford B. Hayes of Ohio, a Republican running against Samuel Tilden of New York, a Democrat. And when the uh, election took place, it appeared as if Tilden, the Democrat, won the election. Uh, but the problem, though, is that uh, the Republicans control the voting in three important districts in the South. And within those states, uh, those districts located in Louisiana, South Carolina, and Florida, there's a tradition of stealing votes, uh, as evidenced by year two, what happened in the year 2000. So, um, so in those days, inauguration did not take place until uh, March. So elections in November, so you know, uh, December, January, February, or so, so four months after the election is when inauguration takes place. So literally uh, a week or two before inauguration day, no one knew who the next president was going to be. So Congress put together a committee made up of eight uh, Republicans, seven Democrats, and an independent who then dropped out and a deal was finally reached where Hayes would get the presidency. There would be economic investment in the South. And so the, the Southern cities would be rebuilt. Atlanta really took advantage of this. And the end of radical reconstruction, that is removal of military troops from the South. And this is an effort to sort of reunite the white North and the white South. And in so doing all of this, along with the Supreme Court cases, which I'll talk about you know, another time, you have an abandonment of black people in the South. We are now abandoned to the various states uh, and there will be no federal government oversight or help in the treatment of black people. So, so as time goes on, it really comes down to who won the war. Certainly the Union won the fighting aspect of this whole thing, but with the abandonment of black people, the South is getting what it wants, really, uh, minus slavery. But that's, but in a nutshell, that's what really what took place uh, during, uh, in a small nutshell, that's what took place during Reconstruction. Uh, I always enjoy, or I always refer to, I guess, the Reconstruction period and the time leading up to, I guess, the 1960s as like, a, I guess, a dead zone in Black history or U.S. history, really, uh, because really all that you cover in school between 1865 and 1960 is World War I, maybe, World War II, definitely, the Holocaust, uh, and I think that's really it, probably, to be honest, um, and there's so much socially going on during these periods, and I think that's important to note that, you know, you have these essentially, you know, white people growing up their entire lives, treating, you know, black people like a property, their dirt. And then suddenly there's this, you know, a, a war is fought 
and now all of a sudden like slaves are gone and these pieces of property are now your equal and yeah. get into that, the violence of it, you know, with KKK, um, you go and talk about the, you know, just the social interactions and just how that, I don't see how people could really dismiss, okay, like, uh, slaves were free, everything was cool and like, you know, groovy and like, it's totally like nice and calm. Like, like no, it's not how it went at all. And I think that's kind of where, or that is where uh, this, the black citizen, because I guess now they're technically citizens, started mm -hmm. this, um, this, uh, I guess, life of generational trauma. And when we look at, well, one thing I always highlight is that the Confederates got pardoned by the presidents after the Civil War for the treason. Um, they were put into, I mean, granted, there, there was integration in the government. Um, can't take that away. But what we saw is that, you know, Confederates, like you said, like, do they really lose the war, war or do they just lose slavery? And right. um, they were put into the government. They're given, like, high-level positions in law. So we're talking about police, op or, like, police officers, as it was back then in the court system, and you have you know, the Black Code, which is based off the slave codes, um, which is you know, early Jim Crow. And what we see here is just this like untalked about period where white people essentially did whatever they wanted to black people, like, oh, even though they were technically citizens. And I think that that type of, I guess that fact is not brought up at all. And I think that's what kind of people that's where people kind of get this disconnect between the past and the present in that they don't understand, you know, where, you know, the frustration comes from. They don't understand like, you know, where racism like comes from really. Cause they always kind of assume that emancipation proclamation ended it, uh, which is like, doesn't make much sense when you really think about it. Um, and I think that the next dead period we hit is um, post civil rights act. I mean, we'll get to that eventually, but think about with that hard, you know, Jim Crow segregation, and suddenly the Civil Rights Act is, you know, passed and so you can't discriminate based on race anymore. And you really think that people who grew up, you know, thinking that black people are second class citizens, thinking that, you know, they're below you are suddenly going to, the day after the law is passed, be like, okay, cool, like, we're good. Like, in my eyes, you're no different than you were two days. Like, that just doesn't, it doesn't make sense that people don't really make that logical connection. And I think that we see the KKK destroying communities, you know, black communities, um, you know, just making it hard to get off the ground. I mean, I know that, um, um, and I feel like I'll probably have to cite this when I go back through it, but um, the stories of, you know, the KKK going through black communities that are trying to establish schools, you know, their own local government, their own, you know, communities and just, you know, the men getting lynched, schools burned down, women like raped. And I think that that unmonitored treatment and, you know, totally that injustice is done throughout the late 19th century. And then that's only exasperated by um, birth of a nation. Um, and prior to that, even that uh, propaganda, the lost cause. And it's just this total abandonment of black people. And I think that kind of emphasizes this idea of black people being this political football where, you know, we'll help you out when we need you. But until then, like, fend for yourselves. And I think that... You made a very good point because, um, you know, you go back to the American Revolution, the War of 1812, the Civil War, the Spanish-American War, um, those, those wars, those initial wars, were fought with the idea that they would be white only. Um, and maybe not so much the Spanish American War, but even then, the charge of San Juan Hill, uh, which Teddy Roosevelt and his rough riders were famous for, was led by black troops. Um, but the uh, but the other, but the previous wars, Revolution, Civil War, uh, War of 1812, uh, America's the bacon was in the fire, and, the black, and black soldiers pulled, the, pulled it out. They did not want black soldiers in the American Revolution. But in the end, they had to get them to use them. And so, and they helped out. Uh, same thing with uh, the uh, War of 1812 uh, and the you know, same the Civil War. So whenever America was in trouble militarily, black troops helped them out. And then they'd come back and face the same. Um, 
you know, one thing to keep in mind as well is that when the Civil War came to an end, uh, people began to travel. They began to go places. I'm talking about, I'm talking about the former slaves here. The, uh, remember that they had lost family members who had been sold. One of the more, uh, one of the sadder stories deals with a family down in Cincinnati, a black family in Cincinnati. They were slaves in Kentucky. And a black man from Cincinnati bought them, bought the entire family, took them from Cincinnati and set them free. The slave owner who sold the family was in debt. And so even though he no longer owned this family, sold the children to some, another slave owner in Virginia, telling the guy, look, um, they ran off here in Cincinnati. So the Virginia slave owner then went ahead and kidnapped the children. Um, uh, most of the children. I think the oldest one may have been 13 or 14, if I remember correctly. The youngest one just a couple of years old. He kidnapped them. So you go through this extraordinary period that this is during the 1850s when Salmon Chase, uh, who later became Lincoln's Treasury uh, Secretary, and I believe Chase at the time was Governor of Ohio, you know, through a series of letters back and forth with Governor of Virginia to try and get these kids back. And uh, the Virginia governor is trying his best to prevent that from happening, but they had this dialogue going on. But, but as it turned out, for the most part, uh, mom and dad never saw their kids until after the war. Uh, when they finally re get reunited, we're talking about a period of like seven, eight years here. Uh, the eldest daughter, you know, uh, had been, uh, was pre got pregnant a couple of times by the slave owner. Uh, a couple of kids died, uh, so the parents never saw those so, saw those children again. So that's one of the sadder aspects of this whole thing here. But slave marriages were not recognized because of the fact that they uh, marriage is a contract, and so in many areas, because it's a contract, uh, slaves are not allowed to have mar uh, weddings, not allowed to get married. And when they were allowed to get married, the, the marital vows were changed to uh, to death or distance to your part to allow for uh, the selling of a spouse. So when the war ended, slaves hit the road, looking for children, looking for a long lost spouse, you know, looking for someone. And so in a lot of cases, yes, they did find family members. A lot of cases they did, never did find family members. And so, and that sort of left a legacy. You know, right now, your Aunt Carol is trying to uh, do a family history and on your father's side especially, it's very difficult because we hit sort of a spot, and then we don't know where to go past that, uh, or before that uh, period of time. So it's a very difficult thing sometimes to try to figure out who you are and what you are. Um, you know, another thing about Reconstruction, you know, that's off of that topic of this little bit here, is the fact that immigration began to really uh, hit hard. A lot of a lot of people moved over, especially from England, uh, to the United States after the Civil War. They, they settled into they call the American West, out in Wyoming and Colorado and places like that. And I remember watching this movie that came out in, I think it was the 1990s, called Silverado. It was a Western with Kevin Klein, Kevin Costner, Danny Glover, um, among others. And John Cleese, who was British, was in that movie and a small bit as a sheriff. And I'm really watching this and my gosh, you've got a British guy who's a sheriff of this Western town but I found out later on that actually was quite accurate, that there were British citizens who were sheriffs. And uh, the whole idea is if you're good with a gun, then you'll be a sheriff. So, so you have the growth of the American West. In 1873, you have a depression that took place. And with that depression, uh, that was brought about because of the fact that the banks had overextended themselves giving out loans, and especially to build railroads, which are all over the place, uh, you know, the Chinese were blamed, Chinese immigrants were blamed. And so, uh, uh, and that, that is always the thing. So just as black people have always been sort of whipping what politically, immigrants, particularly Asian immigrants, um, have been uh, whipping boys too. Uh, and, not just, but, and also Eastern Europeans. I, I, I can't let that go as well. Uh, but certainly the Chinese were blamed for the depression of 1873. They're taking jobs that normally go to Americans, even though Americans not want those jobs, just like you have Latinos today, right. same situation, you know, jobs, you know, picking apples, 
which no, which no American wants to do. So, so you, so that was always the case. But that allowed then for the Congress to pass laws discriminating against Chinese. So, if you're already over here and you're Chinese in 1873, 1874, okay, fine, you can stay, but your families cannot join you. So this prevented Chinese women and Chinese children from joining their husbands if they're already over here. So they never saw them again. And uh, so this country really has had issues with black people, has had, had, you know, had issues with Asians, and had issues really with Eastern Europeans, especially Catholics. That was the whole thing there, was the religion. Yeah, I, th I think that um, I think the whole blame of the immigrants thing is important just because um, a point that I want to start making is that when people say those who don't know history are doomed to repeat it, we're not talking about you know slavery and the Holocaust. We're talking about uh, forms of oppression, control, um, scapegoats, that type of thing. Uh, we're talking about the more subtle tease within, uh, I guess, a corrupt institution. And I think that mm -hmm. when you're looking at the, for example, the focus on immigration, uh, immigrants is when things go bad or uh, you know, when a depression hits, it's because this insert group here is taking away jobs from jobs that Americans would have when those aren't jobs Americans would want or have. Um, and then, it, and that also like only detracts from the fact that you're not looking at the employer who's employing these immigrants for like pennies because of the fact that it maximizes their capitalistic, you know, income. Very good. Um, it, you know, maximize profits. And that's what it comes down to. So once again, it turns into this, and that's just history repeating itself because people don't know. And um, that takes that focus away from that, you know, the system of, I guess, moral compromising, which is capitalism. Um, and I think going, and then just kind of, I know we're always all over the place with these conversations, but going back to that, um, I don't want to call it that great migration, but when, you know, post slavery, uh, when you know black families are moving around trying to locate family, that's another like point where like pre eighteen sixty five black families were you know that that great American family nucleus that we talk about a lot of these days was always destroyed for black communities. I um, mean, look at uh, you know obviously I think that part of it now is that in the nineteen sixties that black culture kind of got corrupted to the point where it always kind of broke up the nucleus, and we can get into that later on. That's definitely much more sociologically like. I guess focus, but um, when we look at like post-slavery, you can't just settle down and start a life and like start building a community without your family. And mm -hmm. post-slavery, you're too busy, you know, sometimes um, without any type of positive result, like aimlessly looking for a family member or a child that got separated at birth because you were a slave. If you're right. without any type of assistance, if you're doing that for like six, 10, 20 years, where are you settling down? Where are you starting, you know, to build a community? What is the government helping you with this? Like, no, they're not. Like they're, you know, so I think that's something people have to realize is that it's not that black people, you know, just didn't settle down and try to create generational wealth. They were trying to, you know, get a hold on their own family or trying to survive and, you know, have their own healthy family nucleus while the government's not helping them at all or in some ways impeding it. And then you also have a situation where uh, when you do have the ability to start building community, white supremacists come by and burn it down and literally destroy people there. And I think it's people don't realize it, like, um, or don't know. And, like, what do they want? And I think that's, I mean, even post-1865 to a degree, and this is, once again, history repeating itself when we talk about those dead zones and knowledge of human rights. And if we look at even post-1965, this hands off like this approach from the government like all right here's some more rights good luck and they kind of like either take their hands off the wheel or they you know manipulate the road so that way you the destination you're going is still controlled by them and we can talk and i think that when we get there the 20th century we can talk about the war on drugs talk about redlining and how that on its own created a uh corruption within this uh development of black culture um but it's the exact same thing where history is repeating itself where, you know, we'll help you get these rights back, but we're not going to help you out of this hole. So good luck getting out of it with that mm -hmm. type of, you know, initial push. I mean, and to, I guess I'm not saying like, you know, I always, I'm not asking like for reparations, but I always thought that reparations should come in the form of investment, such as what the South got post civil war. And you talk about the money that went into the South, 
the uh, you know the pardons of literally treason um, you know, traitors to the country, and they they are put into I guess bureaucratic positions, like appointed to positions of high authority. I, I mean the the Confederate South got more reparations than slaves did. Yeah, sure. I think that that's it's it's something that people don't know or realize or care to acknowledge, and I think that that's just an investment in the community. Um, and granted, like you can never really truly change the racism in someone's heart when they grow up their entire lives looking at blacks as either, you know, subhuman or second class citizens. And it's only one generation removed, and I don't want to get too far into modern day, but you know, you have like you have a grand if you're a white person, you have a grandpa who's 75 years old. I mean, that puts them at like you know, born in what like 18, like 50, like, sorry, 1950s or so, like you know, like uh, mid 1940s. So the first 10, 15 years, 20 years of their life was blacks as second class citizens. Do you really think that your grandpa, over the course of the civil rights movement, which was, you know, 90% people hated MLK, do you think that your grandpa, after 1965, was really like, you know what, like that black person, that Negro over there is a pretty cool guy, I just grab a drink. Like, no, like that's not how it went. I think people keep thinking that there was this automatic switch that clicked when the laws changed that their perception of black people or non-whites change. And I think that's just one of the most frustrating things mm -hmm. to like explain or to try to conceptualize for people is that like their ideas of people, and even if like you weren't like a raging racist, if you are a really rich person who doesn't have to, who's not exposed to black people at all, like all you're getting are the stereotypes, all you're getting, you're not seeing with your own eyes and that just, creates this, once again, this ignorance at the higher levels of the most important positions, the most powerful positions, where they just don't know or have any type of knowledge or interactions with black people. And I think that's like just part of the problem. Um, and that's, I think that's a huge part of the problem even today. Um, and I think that's just my least favorite part about these dead zones in American history when we talk about the society as a whole. And that's post 1865 and post 1965 are the biggest dead zones when it comes to social interaction and social knowledge. And I think those are so important in understanding what's going on today because this isn't an isolated event. You know, the riots that took place post uh, George Floyd are not in a vacuum. Like it's literally, I mean, I will forever make the argument. It goes, it's generational trauma all the way back to the reconstruction period. Um, because it's the same stuff over and over again because history keeps repeating itself because nobody knows it or cares. And I think that's just kind of my soapbox for the day. But that's just. Well, things will be, when we get into the 20th century, you'll see how virulent that racism really becomes. You know, the latter stage of the 19th or something and into the 20th, it becomes really, really rough. And there's a lot to overcome there. Um, and um, there are things taking place socially. Uh, there are things taking place, uh, particularly uh, in the World War II era, which we'll get into later on. Uh, but overall, though, yeah, there are a lot of attitudes are being firmly entrenched. And uh, one of the things we'll discuss uh, in the future will be the attitude of the military. Today, the military is by far the best place to be uh, if you, uh, you know, are Black or Latino or Asian or what have you. It is the most egalitarian institution in the country by far. The military is great for that. Uh, but, you know, 70, 80, 90 years ago, it was not. 100 years ago, it was not. And uh, so, you know, in the future, we'll get into that as well. So, there, But there are things happening on the surface, but it's not until you get to the 1950s and the civil rights movement that starts to kick up here uh, that, uh, you know, things really come, this dead zone, as you put it, really starts to uh, liven up. Hmm, that's interesting. That's interesting about the military part, because I know that, I mean, I guess it's all relative, but I know that a lot of minorities are not as trusting of the military or they're not. I mean, I feel like a lot of, when I mean, you have that whole uh, military branches going into low socioeconomic areas, you know, present these opportunities and everything, but a lot of it's just to kind of, you know, they're vulnerable demographics. Um, mm -hmm. I think it's just, that's more of a class thing, but, you know, if you look at, you know, class and race, I think are closely intertwined because of, you know, I go back as far as the 19th century or, you know, specifically post-1965. Um, but that's just kind of an interesting thought. Because um, I've always thought there were benefits and opportunities in the military. 
But even with like a today, you know, with these missing women, for example, who all happen to be of like non-white Hispanics, that's yeah, we get the military still has a problem with sexism. Right. Okay. A problem with sexism. No doubt about that. And uh, I was looking more along the lines of, uh, you know, I guess from a male perspective, I'll, I'll, I'll be honest with you, from a male perspective, and then looking at individuals of different backgrounds, everyone has, and even the female, you still have opportunity to move up. This that, when I was in the military. Oh, yeah, it's uh, important not to, yeah, just to get yourself some more credibility. Yeah, military you know, service. Yeah. I remember um, we were down in San Antonio, Texas. And we were, uh, we've been there for a couple of weeks and we were practicing uh, walking and saluting officers. There's an officer there and he was critiquing us and you know, correcting us how to do whatever. And then he called a halt to everything uh, because a, a, a flight, there's a, a flight, like a group of people who are you know, in basic training uh, were marching by. They were female. So he called a halt just so we could ogle the women, you know, and so um the uh, uh so i would like to think the military has come a, uh, come a long way since then uh, at least at that but one of the things that really helped was the whole idea of allowing women to fight allow women to be pilots and do the things that men have traditionally done but you still you know no doubt about it you still have serious issues with sex and sex in the military that has to be moved out no doubt about that all right well i think that uh Thanks for doing that as a brief overview of the reconstruction. Uh, I think that we had some pretty good back and forth uh, going off of it. And I think whenever we can, it's important to kind of uh, conceptualize or try to create ways to educate with reference to what's going on today. So I think that that was a good conversation. Um, and uh, I think that's it. Am I in anything you want to like throw in or cover last second or? Cool. So, uh, till next week then, Dad. Sounds good. See you then.